why don't humans have tails? Today, my 12 year old son and I were wondering, why don't humans have tails? When did they lose their tails? What could it have been in the past that caused not having a tail to be more preferable than having a tail? And so why don't we take a look at how we came up with our best hypothesis for when and why humans lost their tail. A couple other questions which are very closely related. Why don't humans have tails? When did humans lose their tails? When did apes lose their tails? And similar questions. Well, we put those questions into Google and the first hit we had was an article from a website called Live Science. And let's take a look, and I apologize for all the ads. But in this article, it talks about how humans ba basically lost their tail two times. The first time was, if, if you think all the way back into ev evolutionary history, of course, fish tails were very flat and had fins. And then on land, of course, the animals did not have fat, fleshy fins. So the tail shape changed when animals came on the land. Not exactly maybe, if you think back to some of the dinosaurs that had very flat tails. Um, perhaps some lizards have a flattish tail. But once you get into the um, most of the um, animals further along, especially the mammals, the tail is pretty thin and it's just bones and muscle, skin and fur. So then when did humans lose their tail? Or when did our first ancestor lose their tail? Well, this article doesn't really go into it other than saying that of course it's, what, it's the distinction between the apes and the monkeys. Okay, so then we go to YouTube. What does YouTube have to say? Well, very nicely, there's a, a story by um, the author of Our Inner Fish. And he talks with Holly Dunsworth, a paleontologist, paleoanthropologist. And basically they talk about it, but on the video that's online, they never say, when did humans lose this, their tail? So what do we do? We don't have the video. We still have the question. Let's find out about apes then. So we go to the Wikipedia and we find out about apes. And apes, about 31 million years ago, separated from the old world monkeys. So the old world monkeys, those were the ones that were not in the Americas. Those are called the new world monkeys. So this is something that happened in the old world, in Asia, Europe, or Africa. <clears throat> so what happened so that not having a tail became so useful? And if you look at the ape ancestors, we have the gibbons or lesser apes, the orangutans, the gorillas, and the chimpanzees. For some reason, they were all more successful than the old world monkeys. But what happened 31 million years ago to cause the tails to go away? Now, one can imagine there's a couple reasons that it might be successful. For example, if there was something in the environment that made it more successful to be tall, then, you know, standing up tall as an old world monkey, the tail would be kind of be in the way it might drag behind or perhaps it would um, be grabbed onto by a predator. So there was some reason that not having a tail was successful, but what was it? For example, if there was an old world monkey 50 million years ago who just happened to be born without a tail due to some genetic mutation, that didn't lead to a whole new branch in the evolutionary tree, at least not one that we've ever found. So what was it 
about this particular mutation, it could have been a, a baby was born and that baby didn't have a tail. So there was some mutation either in the chromosomes of the mother or the father, and that mutation caused the tail not to be grown. Well, the baby, this particular baby, must have been loved, just like any other baby would be, by its parents, who might have looked somewhat like the old world monkeys. But you know, you can notice the similarity between the gibbons and the old world monkeys. You kind of have to blend these back to see, well, what, what would it have looked like way back here? Um, Catarhini monkeys, old world anthropoids. Well, something happened with that one. That one apparently was extremely successful, whether it was a male or a female, it was extremely successful in whatever environment it, it, it was. But why wasn't it until 31 million years ago? So next, we looked and we found that it said that the apes emerged at the boundary of something that happened historically. It was called the, um, here it is, the Oli, Oligocene Miocene boundary. Well, what's a boundary? Well, the boundary is in, in the earth. When you dig down, you can actually see a difference in the layers of sedimentation. And there's something different. Well, where's the boundary come from? What could possibly cause a boundary? Well, boundaries are generally caused by either, they're, they're caused by something being laid down, right? A layer of something. It could be a layer of ash from a volcano or a super volcano. It could be a layer of dust from a impact from an asteroid. Um, you know, what else can a layer come from? So it's either a vol volcanism or an asteroid, but which one? So then we have to look at Oligocene. So the Oligocene, that was the time period that came after the Miocene. So let's look back. It says Ogillocene, Miocene boundary. This is the time between the Ogillocene and the Miocene. So we read up about the Ogillocene, and it said, at the start of the Ogillocene is marked a notable extinction event, event called the Grand Copure. It, features, it featured the replacement of European fauna, European fauna, animals, animals in Europe, with Asian fauna. So the animals in Asia started moving in. Now, why did they move in? Except for the rodents that already lived there and the marsupials. By contrast, the boundary is not set at an easily identified worldwide event, but rather at regional boundaries between the later warmer Oligocene and the relatively cooler Miocene. So th this, this ordering is not good because you should be talking about the Miocene and the Ogillocene being warmer. Let's look at that one more time. The warmer late Ogillocene, that's the late Ogillocene. Oh, we're going younger. Okay, so the Ogillocene, see this is upside down, isn't it? So the Ogillocene, that was the era we were leaving. It was warmer into the Miocene, which was cooler, which makes sense. If there was a volcanic event, which would have put ash up into the sky, or if there was an impact, which would have put dust up into the sky. Either way, you'd have particles in the sky, which would have caused global cooling. Sudden, sudden global, rapid, sudden global cooling, as in suddenly you have this huge winter that you never 
you might not have ever have a, had a winter. So all the animals and plants were not adapted. I mean, there's no possible way to change when there's an impact. All of a sudden, you don't have as much sunlight, the plants start to die, and then the very next, you have this winter, that winter, which has lots and lots of snow all over the place. Organisms aren't adapted for the snow, and then plants die. After the plants die, the animals die, and you have this, this huge, um, huge issue. All right, so, but what happened? Was it a volcano or was it an impact? So then we go to the boundary page. So Eocene, Oligocene extinction event. The transition between the Eocene and the beginning of the Ogilocene. And it should really say into the, the Miocene. 33.9 million years ago. Eocene to Ogilocene. Eocene to Ogilocene, extinction event. The Grand Copature, right? I think I'm looking at the wrong boundary. I think this is the boundary I'm supposed to be looking at. The Eocene to Ogil Ogilocene. See, and this is one of the ways in which we learn as we like are critical and we're like, wait a second, that doesn't fit. That doesn't make sense. But the Grand Copature, that's what we're talking about. And here we are with Grand Copature. Okay, so the Grand Copature Let's double check the grand coperture goes there. Yep. The grand coperture or great break in continuity with a major European turnover in mammalian fauna, that's animals in Europe, 33.5 million years ago, marks the end of the last phase of the Eocene assemblages. The Preabonian and the arrival in Europe of Asian species. So again, something happened in Europe as far as weather. The Grand Kopur is characterized by widespread extinctions and allopatric speciation, meaning that you have species suddenly broadening out. So one species becomes many similar looking species, but each a little bit different adapted to, um, adapted by, I guess you could say, where mutations, little mutations become successful that otherwise would not have been successful in small isolated relic populations. It was given its name to characterize the dramatic turnover in European mammalian fauna, mammals, large mammals, which he placed at the Eocene Oligocene boundary. A comparable turnover in Asian fauna has since been called the Mongolian remodeling. The Grand Kopur, Kupur marks the break between endemic, meaning living there already, European fauna, animals, animals that already lived there before the break, and mixed faunas, different animals, with a strong Asian component afterwards. The grand, see, I should be looking up this word for you. Kopur faunas are dominated by the Parisodact family, an ancient extinct family of herbiferous, looks like basically horses, distant relative to horses. So the horses disappeared, so nobody eat the grass. Six families of cloven hoofed mammals. Also nobody eat the grass, which is to say the grass disappeared. The grass eaters in the winter had nothing to eat. So all these horse relatives died after this event, whether it was a volcano or an impact. The cloven hooved mammals 
And so here we have all sorts of different species that were in Europe at that time. The rodent family, the primate family, here's a primate family. So a sort of monkey. So these monkeys were in Europe prior to that. So certain types of monkeys. The grand copur faunas include the true post-grand copur. So let's see what animals moved in. And so this would have happened after. So how long after? Well, how long is a winter like that going to last? A volcanic winter or a impact winter? I don't know. How much dust is there in the air? Could be five years, 10 years. It'd get a little less each year. So it'd be a bam, it'd get cold. It might lead to an overall cooling event that might, you know, start quick, happen over a hundred or a thousand years. This would be an interesting thing to learn. Um, and so this would be the direction we'd want to look to, to when did apes, when did it become a favored trait that there was a baby born without a tail? Why would that become so successful that they were the ones that were super successful at mating with others and having babies that also didn't have tails? Was it possible that there were two that were born that didn't have a tail, a male and a female, and when they were together, their babies didn't have tails, and of course, none of their descendants would have tails either as long as they continued to interbreed. I think it's more likely that only one didn't have their tail, and then that was a dominant trait, which was passed down. But after a while, suppose it was on the X chromosome, for example. Well, the X chromosome only comes from the mother. So how would that work? If a, if a baby was born and the mutation was on the X chromosome that caused the tail not to grow, because it didn't, it didn't send the signal for the tail to grow to that part of the body in the, in the uterus. Then when, if it was female, it would have passed that X on to its children. And the Y would have come from the male. So if it's on the X chromosome, the tailness, then that X chromosome would be passed down on the female line. So, the children of all those filled females would be tailless children. I think that's right. Again, this is where use your thinking, and that's why this is a hypothesis. <laughs> it's a hypothesis because I'm not sure this is a this could be an area of study for a, a PhD student who's studying paleoanthropology or something like that. Okay, let's look at the post grand copur faunas. They include the true rhinoceroses, big rhinoceroses, three artiodactyl families, hell pig, hmm, cool. That's a big, some big pigs. Related species of, to the pigs, hippos, rudiments, rodent families, flying rodents, interesting, hamsters, beavers, Lots of water, hedgehogs, a small ungulate, which I mean, un ungulates, those are, seems like they're horses. Only the marsupial family and artiodactyl family and rodent families crossed the faunal divide undiminished. It has been suggested that this is caused by climate change, you think, <laughs> associated with the earliest polar glaciation. So this event was a big event. It was so big that it cooled the Earth's temperature down by like two degrees. And if it cooled it down by two degrees, then that would have caused a huge glaciation. In other words, the ice sheets 
at the North Pole and South Pole would have, it would have frozen, right? So the North Pole would have frozen the ocean, the Arctic Ocean. And uh, on, the, on Antarctica, Antarctica, there would have been, all the snowfall would have never melted. So it would have started piling up and piling up. Same thing with Greenland. And same thing with anywhere north where the snow would never melt. So any of the glaciations. So now we can learn about glaciations. And a major fall in sea levels. Well, of course, there's going to be a fall in sea levels if you have a buildup of ice on the land. Then the sea level is going to go down because where's the water going? It's going onto the land. It's going onto Antarctica and Greenland and probably like, you know, far north Alaska and far north Siberia and mountains, you know, mountains like the Alps, um, anything that was cool already if the temperature went down two degrees and of course two degrees means two degrees globally it doesn't mean two degrees like everywhere it means that's the average there might be some places that were warmer because of a change in weather patterns the circulation or ocean current circulations and if the sea level goes down then that certainly you can imagine that having an impact on circulations and if the northern and southern hemisphere were, were cloud covered much more, then there'd be a lot of heat coming in to the equatorial regions, which would cause that water to be relatively warmer and it would change the circulation patterns, which would again have feedbacks on where is it warm and where is it cool. Huh. So it has been suggested that this was caused by climate change associated with the earliest polar glaciations and a major fall in sea levels or by competition with taxa, animals and plants, and everything else, organisms, dispersing from Asia. So from Asia moving in to Europe. So that means that there's, there's space for something. So you, you can imagine after this winter, and all the species that were there died, mostly, as we saw, most of them died. Most of the plants, most of the grasses, most of the animals that lived off the grasses, um, they died. The primates died. Primates live in trees. So that means something happened that the trees didn't have fruit in them anymore. Well, if it's not tropical, they're not going to fruit in the winter, are they? So because there was a winter, there was no fruit, all the primates died. They had nothing to eat. They weren't seed eaters, so they couldn't eat that. Um, monkeys are herbivores, so they can't read, really eat each other. I mean, raw, eating a raw, somewhat, eating, Flesh is not really something that digests in a primate's stomach. They're, they're herbivores, more or less. I mean, I suppose they, they fight with each other and they bite. E they might bite another species, and they might even like chew on them. And uh, <laughs> I mean, if they get this fight-flight instinct, right? When you're when you're scared, you might fight until you kill someone and eat them. I suppose, but I don't think you'd actually eat them as in they're gone. And how yeah, how how long are you going to have that angry feeling? Oh, that angry feeling. You know, that's, you know, being enraged, yes. You know, if you're, if you're scared for your family, you can be enraged and end up killing someone on purpose or accidentally. That doesn't mean you really want to eat them, though. <laughs> not very tasty, not for humans. Humans like sugar, you know, uh, or not just humans, but all the apes, we like fruit. So, um, but we're not related to them anyways. They went extinct. That was the other ones we're related to. However, few argue, a small number of scientists argue for a isolated single cause. So a huge volcanic super volcano couldn't do it? A impact event couldn't do it? Well, let's find out. Other possible causes related to the impact of one or large, more large bolides in the northern hemisphere at Copiagi, Tom's Canyon, or Chesapeake Bay. Well, let's see how big are these impact events. 100 kilometer, that's a pretty big crater. <laughs> 100 kilometers, that's also a big, big, oh, 150 kilometers, oh, east of. Uh, let's see, Tom's, Tom's Canyon impact crater is 
a probable impact crater, probable, where one or more asteroids struck the Atlantic continental shelf about 100 miles east of Atlantic City, New Jersey. The submarine canyon is the drowned glacial edge mouth of Tom's River. Chesapeake Bay, improved correlation of Northwest European succession to global events confirms that the Grand Kopur as occurring in the earliest Oligocene with a hiatus of 250 millennia prior to the first record of the post Grand Kopur Asian immigrant taxa. The element of the paradigm of the Grand Kopur, and if you're watching this on YouTube, I understand. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it exactly right, so thank you was the apparent extinction of all European primates. So suddenly there's nobody to eat fruit. Well, if there's nobody to eat fruit, then there's this huge amount of food there that nobody's eating. So who's gonna come and eat the fruit? Somebody's gotta come and eat the fruit. Somebody will come and eat the fruit because someone will notice, hey, there's fruit over there. And they'll go eat it. And they'll say, hey, there's fruit over there. And they'll go eat it. And they'll just move in that direction. They'll be like, whoa. And they'll have lots of babies and they'll keep on moving from Asia into Europe. Huh. Of a mouse sized, reflecting the better survival chances of small mammals, they stayed okay. Evidence in the world ocean current system indicate an abrupt cooling across the boundary. The remarkable cooling period in the ocean is correlated with pronounced mammalian faunal, faunal replacement within continental Asia as well. So Asia got cold as well. The Asian biotic reorganization events are comparable to the Grand Kopur in Europe and the Mongolian remodeling of mammalian communities. The global cooling is also correlated with a marked drying conditions in lower latitude Asia. Drying conditions. So again, you know, mutations occur fairly frequently. If you look at it in millions of years, there's going to be babies that are born occasionally without a tail in the animal kingdom. Not very often, not necessarily successful. Are they going to have babies? Hmm. Not if they're like the outcast. I mean, if they can't provide to the community, no. But what if they have some special advantage? What if they find themselves in grasslands and suddenly being tall and be able to run fast and not having a tail behind you is helpful? So helpful, in fact, that you become the alpha or the, the beta, you become, you become the one that everybody looks to. Mm. So that could be in grasslands, which there would have been after the trees died. So there would have been a lot of grass. Um, or it could be like in the Atabango in, um, let's switch to the map. Oh, here's one of the craters. So this crater, Popi Guy Crater, Popi Guy Crater, Siberia, extinction event might be linked to the extinction event there. Um, most modern industrial diamonds are produced synthetically. The diamond deposits at Popi Guy have not been mined because of the remote, remote, remote location and lack of infrastructure and are unlikely to be competitive when, with synthetic diamonds. Many of the diamonds at Popi Guy contain crystalline lonsdalite, an allotrope of carbon that has a hexagonal lattice, pure laboratory created Lonesdalite is up to 58% harder than ordinary diamonds. These types of diamonds are known as impact diamonds because they are thought to be produced when a meteorite strikes a graphite deposit at high velocity. They may have industrial uses but are unsuitable as gems. Interesting. Additionally, carbon polymorphs, even harder than Lon's delight have been discovered in the crater. So this was an incredibly hard impact. This wasn't like an impact 
of a ice ball. This was a hard, hard impact that smashed the ground so hard that all the, the layers and layers of dead trees underneath the ground that became graphite got smashed so hard together that they became diamonds, not, not the, whole, the whole thing. But so this is a huge impact crater. So if you want some diamonds of this type, now you know where to go. <laughs> um, for decades, the Popey Guy crater has fascinated paleontologists. And the reason I focus on this one is because this is the one that's likely to bring up the most dust, right? The other two were impacting in the water. This one is impacting on the land. So it's gonna bring the most dust up. So it's the one that's most likely, well, it's the one that would have brought up the most dust. So which one is gonna be the one that caused the, the, the global winter, the, the impact winter? But the entire area was completely off limits because the diamonds there. However, a major investigatory expedition was undertaken, which greatly advanced understanding. The impactor in this event has been identified as either a eight kilometer diamond chondrocyte asteroid or a five kilometer diameter stony asteroid. So now this tells us how big of an asteroid would we need to be worried about to have a global winter that would totally change what was living and where it was living. Eight kilometers, five miles, or five kilometers, three miles. Now, what's the difference here? The difference here is probably the mass. So they're calculating back based on the mass. So a, a chondrocyte, asteroid would have to be of five miles in diameter. A stony asteroid would only have to be three miles in diameter. So which is more likely? Well, the smaller ones are more likely. So it was probably a stony asteroid only three miles across that impacted, that caused an ice age, <laughs> the extinction of many, many species, probably not just in the Northern Hemisphere, but globally, enough dust that it laid down a layer, some change in the, the land on the boundary of where the, the monkeys died because of the winter and where the trees didn't die. So on that boundary where the trees didn't die, living there along that boundary, those monkeys, one of those monkeys was born without a tail, like sometimes happens. And where the trees died was the grass. The grass came up first. And of course, along the boundary, the one who was tall is the one who would have went out onto the grass easily didn't have to worry about his tail being bitten by some predator, was nice, was able to stand up taller than the others, was able to eat the seeds of the grass or go out and look at the flowers or do whatever, probably only drawn out into the grasslands because of food. So there must've been something growing out there, food, bushes, something, something where it was advantageous to be tall to be able to see predators and not to have your tail sticking out in the back. So something made, him or her a wonderful leader. And when he had children or she had children, they were also wonderful leaders. And so this led to speciation where we separate the apes from the old world monkeys. Okay, let's see what else we can learn. Interesting. Um, so let's go back and take a look. So here we are in on Earth. And we're looking at this crater event. So the asteroid came in, bam, it's only five miles. Now, if we were able to actually zoom in on this central, usually when the, an asteroid comes in, it, it punches so hard, it pushes the crust down and it actually brings up like the central spot and then it has this echo that goes outward. So if you were to look at other impact craters, you'd see like this, bam, and it echoes out kind of like the asteroid craters that ended the um, the era, era of the dinosaurs. 
so now let's look and see, well, if all the apes, the monkeys in Europe died, then where would have been this boundary from where the apes died, the monkeys died because of the, the event? Well, that's a good question. Not entirely sure about that. But if we zoom out, we take a look. So imagine the entire northern part of the earth is covered in winter, and the entire southern part of the earth is covered in winter, and the entire earth as a whole gets colder. But the trees can't move like super rapidly. You know, at that time, what was what was the status of this part of Africa? Was it grasslands or was it forest? Or was it something in between? Um, well, if there was forest all over Europe, and there was forest probably down this way, um, that's a good question. So I'm guessing, again, that's why it's a hypothesis, that somewhere along the boundary of the grasslands and the forests, or if the trees all died, maybe that caused a large grassland, somewhere along this boundary, the apes, those without the tail, became successful in the grasslands. Okay, so let's go back to apes. The distinction between apes and monkeys is complicated by the traditional um, para Phyle of monkeys. Apes emerged as a sister group of old world monkeys in the Cathrites, which are a sister group of the new world monkeys. Therefore, cladistically, apes, Cathrites, and related contemporary extinct groups are monkeys as well for any consistent definition of monkey. Old world monkey may also legitimately be taken to be meant to be the Catathine thines, including apes and extinct species. Um, okay. Primates called apes today became known to Europeans after the 18th century. Traditionally, the English language vernacular apes, modern taxonomy, some or all recent, some or recently all hominids are also apes. Ape uh, from apa is a word of uncertain origin, the term has a history of rather imprecise usage and of comedic or punning usage in the vernacular. Its earliest meaning was generally of any non-human anthropomoid primate. Okay, this is not uh, ape. Later, after the term monkey had been introduced into the English, ape was specialized for reference to tailless, therefore exceptionally human-like primate. The term ape obtained two different meanings and show, as shown in the Encyclopedia Britannica, it could be used as a synonym for monkey. No, that's not, that's not good. Okay, so phenology, we already looked at the phenology. It says the gibbon split from the rest about 18 million years ago. So 25 million years ago, our ancestors, there was someone who was born without a tail. Um, my conjecture on this was it was a female, and then this is a X chromosomal trait. Um, the gibbons split from the rest about 18 million years ago. So I'm curious where the gibbons live. And the hominid split happened 14 million years ago. The gorilla split seven million years ago, pan homo, Five million years ago. In 2015, a new genus and species was described, which lived 11, 12, 11.6 million years ago and appears to predate the split between hominidae and hylobatidae. Okay. So let's take a look. So we had various splits, and these splits each would have been associated with apes living in different environments where certain mutations would have been, instead of 
a disadvantage to have would become an advantage to have. And so there would be the, that, um, the one that had that mutation would be more successful at mating, much more successful because they got food much more readily than the rest. It would be that that trait would of course vanish if it was very much less favored. And this is all, any, any mutation is like that. It's going to either enhance or it's going to <laughs> unenhance. Okay. It's, it's going to harm, right? Because if it, makes it, if it makes it less possible to get food, if you're the last one to get the food, you're going to be smaller, you're not going to mate, and your babies, even if you have them, are not going to be taken care of. I mean, if, if you think of humans, humans have to be taken care of for a very long time. Okay. So apes always interest me. We could go and see, I'm just curious to see the gibbons. Where did the gibbons um, live originally? Do, 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 gibbons. We need a link to gibbons. Homididae, lesser apes, apes, and homididae, greater apes. The gibbons, the apes in the family, Hylobotidae. This family historically contained one genus, but now it's Clinton or fine. Gibbons live in subtropical and tropical rainforests. So they're the ones that are, they have some sort of adaptation that made them super good in the trees. Longer arms, maybe? Different nose shape? I don't know. Gibbons live in the subtropical and tropical rainforest from Bangladesh to India, southern China, Indonesia, Sumatra, Borneo, Java. So let's take a look. Bangladesh to India to China to Indonesia. Let's look on our globe again. So this whole area was the gibbons. The land of the gibbons. Okay. Um, also called the lesser apes or smaller apes, gibbons differ from the great apes the chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, orangutans, and humans in being smaller, exhibiting low sexual dimorphism. In other words, the males and females look almost identical. You can't really tell them apart. Uh, they're the same size and everything. And not making nests. They don't make nests. Well, that's a big difference, isn't it? If you don't make nests, then you're not sleeping in the trees. You're sleeping on the ground, probably. So the ones that could make nests and sleep in the trees they would have done really well in trees where they could build nests. In certain anatomical details, they superficially more closely resemble monkeys than great apes do. But unlike apes, gibbons are tailless. But like all apes. Unlike most of the great apes, gibbons frequently form long-term pair bonds. Unlike most great apes. Humans are great apes. Frequent pair bonds. Interesting that they look very, very similar and they pair bond, which means they find a mate and they stay with that mate for life because, you know, when you look exactly similar to someone, then, I mean, that, that if you have the same thinking process, then you're very likely to want to stay with them. Their primary mood of locomotion, I love this word, brachiation, <laughs> involves swinging from branch to branch for distances of up to 15 meters at speeds of up to 55 kilometers per hour. They can also make great leaps, eight meters, and walk bipedally with their arms raised for balance. They're the fastest and most agile of all tree-dwelling non-flying mammals. Depending on the species sex, gibbons, fur coloration varies from dark to very light shades and any shade between black and white, though a completely white, though a completely white gibbon is rare. Gibbon species include the Siamang, which looks quite incredibly a lot like a chimpanzee, doesn't it? The white-handed ER gibbon and the Hulak gibbons. Evolutionary history. Whole genome and molecular dating analysis indicates that the gibbon lineage diverged from that of the great apes around 16.8 million years ago. 98% confidence that somewhere between 19... 15.9 and 17.6 million years ago. 
So, you know, what happened to cause it to diverge during that 1 million year period? Given a divergence of 29 million years from monkeys. Adaptive divergence associated with chromosomal rearrangement led to rapid radiation of four genera about 6 million years ago. So there were some chromosomal rearrangements. So maybe instead of 46 chromosomes, maybe it became two of the chromosomes bonded together and now they had 44. I wonder how many chromosomes they have. Each genus comprises a distinct well-delineated lineage, but the sequence and timing of divergences along the genera has been hard to resolve even with the whole genome data due to radiative speciations and extensive incomplete lineal, lineage sorting. Incomplete lineage sorting, that looks like an interesting topic. An analysis based on morphology, that's body shape, suggests that the four genera, the four species, are ordered this one, and then this one is a subspecies, and these two are subspecies. So it splits, splits like this. Boop, 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 boop. And then homidae. A convalescent-based multi-species convalescent process is a stochastic process model that describes the genealogical relationship for a sample of DNA sequence. The coalescent based species tree analysis of genome scale data suggest a phylogeny, phylogeny of the four genera ordered as this one. So the genes say it's ordered in this one, in this way. At the species level, estimates from mitochondrial DNA, so mitochondrial DNA, this is DNA that is in, inside the ova of the the mother. And when the ova is fertilized by the sperm, now you have um, inside are the energy cells. And these energy, they're, they're like, they're like, they're like little tiny cells inside your cells. <laughs> they're energy cells. They, they bring in um, the energy molecules, the sugar or whatever that comes in the ATP, and they they quickly process that and they spin. And there's some wonderful videos online, I think uh, BBC videos or something about the cell. Look up the cell as a documentary. Fascinating, fascinating, the cell. Um, I don't know if it was a Nova or a BBC Nature or what it was. At the species level, estimates for mitochondrial DNA genome analysis suggest that um, hylobates, Pilatus diverged from H E R and H Aglis around 4 million years ago. So this is talking about really recent divergence. Um, taxonomy, hybrids, physical description. One unique aspect of Gimmed's anatomy is the wrist, which functions something like a ball and socket joint, allowing for biaxial movement. This greatly, re greatly reduces the amount of energy needed in the upper arm torso while also reducing stress on the shoulder joint. Gibbons also have long hands and feet with a dip, deep cleft between the first and second digits in their hands. Their fur is usually different color. Some species such as the siamang have an enlarged throat sac which inflates and severely uh, serves as a resonating chamber when the animals call. The structure can become quite large in some species sometimes equaling the size of the animal's head. Their voice are much more powerful than that of any human singer, although they are at best half a human type. Okay, I guess proportionality. Uh, Gibbon skulls and teeth resemble those of great apes, and their noses are similar to those of their primate ancestors. The dental formulation is 2123, which would be the different uh, teeth shapes. The siamang which is the largest of 18 species. It's distinguished by having two fingers on each foot stuck together, hence the generic and species name um, Symphalongus and Syndactylus. Like all primates, gibbons are social animals and humans. They are 
all apes. They are strongly territorial and defend their boundaries with vigorous visual and vocal displays. The vocal element, which can often be heard for distances of up to one kilometer, consists of a duet between a mated pair and their young, sometimes joining in. In most species, males and females, males and some females sing solos to attract the males. This is interesting. As well as advertise their territories. The song can be used to identify not only which species of gibbon is singing, but also the area in which it comes from. The song can be used to identify not only which species of gibbon is singing, but also the area from which it comes. Gibbons often retain the same mate for life, although they do not always remain sexually monogamous. So occasionally they might mate with someone that's not their, their pair bonded mate. In addition to extra pair copulations, that's mating with someone who's not a pair bonded, pair bonded gibbons occasionally divorce. That's interesting. Gibbons are among nature's best brachiators. Yep. The ball and socket wrist joint allows them unmatched speed and accuracy when swinging through trees. So they were super successful in trees, probably especially if there's any predators in the trees. So if there was predators, the gibbons would have been super successful because they would have been able to get rid of, get away from them. So what kind of predators? Large cats or something? Nonetheless, their mode of transportation can lead to hazards when a branch breaks or a hand slips. And researchers estimate that the majority of the gibbons suffer bone, bone fractures one or two times during their lifetimes. They are the fastest and the most agile of all tree-dwelling non-flying mammals. What do gibbons eat? Gibbons diet consists 60% fruit-based. They also consume twigs. I don't like twigs myself. Leaves, sure, I like leaves. Insects, not my favorite, but I suppose flowers. Yep, and occasionally bird eggs. Why occasionally? Because birds put nests like way, way out. <laughs> it's hard to get them. So not very often. Um, fascinating. Let's go over to ape. Ape. No, uh, hominidae. Okay, so these are the great apes. These are the apes that are more related to us than the gibbons are. Hominidae. Hominidae, whose members are known as great apes or hominids, are a taxonomic family of primates that includes eight extant, that means living, species in four genera. Um, so, so in each genera, you can have a species, you can have multiple species. Pongo, which is the chimpanzees, the Bornean and Sumatran and Tapanuli or orangutan, gorilla in the eastern and western gorilla, and pan, the most common chimpanzee, and the bonobo, and of course the homo, homo, homo which is us. Several revisions in classifying the great apes have caused the term hominid to vary over time. The original meaning of hominid referred only to humans. Of course, they're all humans. They're just not humans like us humans. The restrictive meaning has largely been assumed. Da, 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 da. This is just talking about the words we use. Within the taxon, a number of extant living and known extinct, ones that are gone, that is fossil genera are grouped within the humans, chimps, and gorillas, others within the orangutans or orangutan. When I grew up, that was called orangutan. In my school, maybe it was a pronunciation issue. Orangutan, orangutan. The most recent common ancestor of all the hominidae lived around 14 million years ago when the ancestors of the orangutan speciated from the ancestral line of the other three genera. Those ancestors of the family hominidae had already speciated from the gibbons perhaps 15 to 20 million years ago. And we could go back to them and so, say, well, when did, when did they speciate? Um, did we not see that? 16.8 million years ago. Apparently the editor of um, this page did not go over to this page and say this is when the split occurred. 
due to a close genetic relationship between humans and the other great apes, certain organizations, such as the Great Ape Project, argue that great apes are persons and should be gave, given basic human rights. Rights is a weird word. They just should be free. They should be left alone and nobody should go into their place. They should leave them alone. No one should go there at all. Nobody. It's their home. Stay away. Leave them alone. Just leave them alone. That's their country. That's their land. Don't come into their camp, land or country. Just leave them alone on their island or whatever it is. Leave them alone. Leave their environment alone. Um, that's what it means by rights. I mean, rights is such a weird word. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean anything really. Um, 29 countries have already instituted a research ban to protect the apes from any kind of testing. Well, the only thing important about the apes is that you stay out of their place. Just leave them alone. Don't let any loggers go in there. Don't let any farmers go in there. Don't let anybody go in there. It's a national wildlife, it's a wildlife area, a global wildlife preserve. Evolution. In the early Miocene, about 22 million years ago, there were many species of arboreal adapted primate catarines from East Africa. So they were in East Africa. Let's go to the map, East Africa. East Africa, East and West. So East Africa over here, probably here, the Egypt area, but let's say here, East Africa. The variety suggests a long history of prior diversification. Fossils at 20 million years ago. Now, when are we looking at? Oops, Gibbons. We're looking about 17 million years ago. Fossils at 20 million years ago include fragments attributed to the earliest old were monkeys, among the genera thought to be in the ape lineage leading up to 13 million years ago, lots of ones. At sites far distant from East Africa, the presence of other generalized non-old world monkeys, that is non-monkey primates, of middle Miocene age from cave deposits in Namibia. Okay, so M Namibia, I was talking with my son about this earlier. So what if the Namibian desert right here, the Namib, um, what if that desert either was spreading or, or retracting after that asteroid impact? So what if the apes that were in this area, the grassland ex extended because it became drier. So it became drier and the grassland expanded. So this is, this is another, another um, direction we could take this thinking. The Adabango right here, and this might be where it happened. So in the Adabango, if you've seen BBC Planet Earth or Planet Earth 2, I don't remember which it is, but the Adabango floods every year, it floods. And you'll notice it's just like a delta. So there's lots of rains in the north here. The rain comes down, it floods the Adabango. It becomes all green and lush and everything. The monkeys that live there, they cross the rivers and stuff. They cross, they have to stand up and they go like this, and they're carrying their babies with them and they're going across. Well, isn't that the place where there's all sorts of um, predators in the water? Wouldn't it be useful to not have a tail in this place? I mean, that would be so useful. Nobody could grab onto your tail. You might be able to stand a little bit taller. It might be easier to carry your baby. I mean, if you were taller and you were able to see something, if you were just able to get away, I mean, if you were able to get away and your kids were able to get away and their kids were able to get away and their kids were able to get away, I mean, wouldn't your, 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 you know, your cousins that had tails, wouldn't they become less and less successful while you were able to get away because nobody's pulling on your tail in the out of Ango? 
So here's another possibility. Maybe this is where it happened, and it happened because of the impact which caused the Namib Desert to form. Now we have to look at the Namib de Desert and how old is the Namib, Namib, Namib Desert. Let's just look for a moment and, and see if it even lines, lines up. Wikipedia, uh, Namib. Namib Desert. There's a great series about the Namib Desert um, that I remember watching years and years ago. Uh, let's see, Fell Desert. Now this one's old, okay? So this is a very old desert, vast place. Searching for million. Having endured arid or semi-arid conditions for roughly 55 to 80 million years, the Namib may be the oldest desert in the world and contains, contains some of the world's driest regions. With only Western South America's Atacama Desert to challenge it for age of uh, aridity benchmarks. So deserts, one thing to know about deserts is when there's climate change, the deserts change super fast because the amount of water, if there's just a little more water, I mean, that, that greens things up. It allows a lot more animals to be there. And even if there's a little more water, and what we're talking about is we're talking about the very edge of the desert. So right near the ocean, you know, it's sand dunes. Okay, so you're not gonna have a little more rain is probably not gonna do something there. But on the other side, on this dry side, like over here, that could be, I mean, if there was just a little bit of climate change, if it got colder, the plants, it wouldn't be so hot, the plants would be able to expand, especially if there was more rainfall, and there's probably be more rainfall. This is kind of a, annoying. Looks like they're doing all sorts of uh, mining or something here. Can you kind of see the, I don't know if you can see the shapes. There's all these spots. Spot, spot, spot. Or is this, is this testing? Is this nuclear testing? It looks like impacts, doesn't it? What is this? Very curious. There's so many curious things in the world. You're like, what, what are these things? So, I, and I wonder, what is this feature over here? That looks like it's a lake that's now a salt lake. That, so apparently there was a lake there at one time. Could that have played into it? I think I think going through the Atavango was probably, this is where the humans who didn't have tails, where the apes who didn't have tails might have originated. But let's go back one more time to apes. Um, they're distinguished from the other primates by, oops, not that one, homile, taxonomy. So how's their body different? How did it make them different? Not taxonomy, physio not phenology. What do we got here? Physical description, there we go. <sighs> the great apes are the tallest primates. So being in water wouldn't want, that would be helpful to be taller, right? Because you could go through deeper water. With the smallest living species being the bonobo. So they're probably the least related to us, maybe not. Um, actually, they're closer. Yeah, they're closer related to us. In weight, the largest being the Eastern gorillas with the males weighing very large and the great apes. The males are on average taller and stronger than the females. That's called sexual dimorphism, two morphous shape, two shapes. Although the degree of sexual dimorphism varies greatly among species. Among most living species, although most living species are predominantly quadru quadrupeds, zebras, they are able 
to use their hands for gathering food. Gathering food, gathering, collecting, collecting, taking it back somewhere. Or nesting materials. And we talked about the nesting. So we already got that. And in some cases for tool use. Most species are omnivorous, but notice it says citation needed, <laughs> which means that that's not true. There's no evidence for that. But fruit is the preferred food. They eat fruit, probably 60% at least, among all but some human groups. Well, humans that have fire will eat right. Occasionally, they will kill an animal and eat it because of fire. If there was no fire, then obviously fruit eaters are not going to eat meat unless they have fire to make the fruit be like meat. Um, chimpanzees and orangs primarily eat fruit. <laughs> when gorillas run short on fruit at certain times of the year or in certain regions, they resort to eating shoots like celery and leaves, often of bamboo, a type of grass. Gorillas have extreme adaptations for chewing and digesting such low quality forage. So, I mean, that would make sense because I mean, this is a long story, right? I mean, if you're big and heavy, you're not gonna go up in the tree and get the fruit. So the big and heavy ones that are successful are gonna be the ones that are able to eat the stuff on the ground better. Those are the ones that are going to be better and better. So the gorillas were the ones that stayed on the ground first, right? They were the bigger and heavy ones. Um, humans did not descend from them though. If we look at the line, where, where is it? Uh, the, 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 the gorillas, so they were on the ground. We were late, related to the, the chimpanzees and more importantly, the bonobos. And the difference is actually cultural. The, the chimpanzees, they are more, uh, they are more easily spooked. <laughs> they have like that part of their brain is more active freeze, fight, flight at part. Whereas um, the bonobos, which it says pan, pan iscum, smaller. So we, we could, we could, this will have to be a different episode, but let's go back to where we were at with the food. Obviously humans are fruit, fruit eaters primarily. But not just fruit. I mean, they eat, as, as we saw, seeds and things. Um, let's see what else. The gorillas, they have extreme adaptations for chewing and digesting such low quality forage, but they still prefer fruit when available. So do I. <laughs> I eat strawberries and mangoes and apples and bananas. I love fruit. And I love fruit. There's something in our evolutionary past which um, we co-evolved with fruit, our ancestors, and fruit has sugars in it that we co-evolved loving. You know, we, we, we seek it. Often going miles out of their way, miles out of their way to find especially preferred fruits. So our ancestors would, tr they would search for fruits. If there was anything else, they'd go and look a fruit, look for some fruit. Um, a lot of those documentary shows that feature chimpanzees will show this as well. And there's not as many documentaries featuring the bonobos, unfortunately. Humans, since the Neolithic Revolution, consume mostly cereals. So the ne Neolithic Revolution, if you don't know what that is, that's when um, Somebody spilt some seeds on the ground. They noticed, hey, those seeds grew. Wow, that was really cool. We should like actually put them in the ground in purpose. And so in that part of the world where it was like really, really easy to grow seeds, they grew lots and lots of seeds, mostly cereals. So a cereal is any grass cultivated for the edible components of its grain, composed of the endosperm, the germ, and the bran. This the term may also refer to the resulting grain itself. Cereal grain crops are grown in greater quantities and provide more energy 
worldwide than any other crop. And other starchy foods. Well, what's our, what are starchy foods? Well, we'd have to look at that, including increasingly highly processed. Yeah, that's we're talking about civilization now. Domesticated plants and meat. Yeah, well, hominid, hominid teeth are similar to those of the old world monkeys and gibbons, though they are especially large in the gorilla. The dental formation is two, one, two, four, two, three. Human teeth and jaws are markedly smaller as in, they were not on the ground, so they weren't eating leaves very much. Our mouths are designed to eat, not designed. The mouths that were most successful at bringing in food were these mouths for the food that was available. The mouths that were not as adapted to the food? <laughs> All right. Um, hominid teeth are similar to the old world monkeys. We said that dental formation. Human teeth and jaws are markedly smaller for their size of the other apes, which may be an adaptation to only having su supplanted with extensive tool use, the role of the jaws in hunting and fighting, hunting and fighting, but also eating cooked food since the end of the Paleocene. So when did we start cooking food, which would have led to the cooking of actually animal flesh? Now we have to go to the Paleocene and find out about that. Um, gestation in apes lasts for eight to nine months, it results in the birth of a single offspring, rarely, rarely twins. The young are born helpless and require care for a long period of time. That means humans are infinitely loving. Compared with most other, other mammals, apes, great apes, have a remarkably long adolescence, not being weaned for several years. Well, they're not weaned usually until like eight years old um, in the hum humans that live uncontacted from the rest of the world. There are still a few of them on Sentinel Island off of like near India in New Guinea um, and in the Amazon, which has not yet been attacked by uh, the global economy or civilization, whatever you want to call it. As a result, females typically give birth only once every few years. It's usually after one is basically done weaning. The gorillas and the chimpanzees live, live in family groups of around five to ten individuals, although much larger groupings are sometimes noted. Now again, they live in the trees where humans live in the grasslands. Chimpanzees live in larger groups that break up into smaller groups when fruit becomes less available. When small groups of female chimpanzees go off in separate, separate directions to forage for fruit, the dominant males can no longer control them, and the females often mate with other so, sub, subordinate males. In contrast, groups of gorillas stay together regardless of availability of fruit. When fruit is hard to find, well, they're big. You know, they weren't as fast. The ones that were faster and nimbler were the ones that were able to get the fruit first. So the big guys, they weren't able to get there first. <laughs> when fruit is hard to find, they resort to eating leaves and shoots. Because gorillas group together, groups stay together, the male is able to monopolize the female in his group. This fact is related to the gorilla's greater sexual dimorphism, he's a lot bigger, relative to that of the chimpanzees. That is the difference between the size of the male and the female. The gorilla is much greater than that between the male and the female chimpanzee. This enables the gorilla males to physically dominate female gorillas more easily, dominate in both chimpanzees and gorillas, the groups include at least one dominant male and young males leave the group at maturity. Okay. So now what I'd really like to go to, I'm very curious, is the branching that happens right here, okay? Because now let's let's go after the gorilla. What happened? What happened to separate the gorillas from? Actually, what happened to separate the, the chimps 
from the humans. Are we on this page already? No, we're not. Ho minini. Hominini or hominins form a taxonomic tribe of the subfamily Hominine. Hominini, the extant genera Homo, human, and Pan, chimpanzees and bonobos, but exclude, excludes the gorillas. The tribe was originally introduced by John Edward Gray. Long before any details on the speciation of Pan and Homo were known, Gray's tribe, Hominini, by definition includes both Pan and Homo. This definition is still adhered to in the proposal by Mann and Weiss, which divides Hominini in three subtribes, Panini, which is Pan, Hominine, and Austro, Austro, Australopithecina containing several extinct species. Alternate, um, hominini is taken to exclude pan, no. Minority dissenting nomenclature includes gorilla, no. Um, cladogram, let's take a look at the cladogram. Do, 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 do. Okay, we're looking at our extinct ancestors. Where is there's the chimps? Evolutionary history. Nice, only one little paragraph. Huh. Now, where is this? Find two of seven. So this is not helpful. Look, you're, you're introducing a new word in the middle of nothing. It's not even related to chimpanzee human last common ancestor. So I'm not interested in that. I want to know the split between the gorillas. Well, I'm interested in that as well. Um, both, both species existed during, this, is, this paragraph is horrible. It's just, someone needs to come in and work on this paragraph because it's, it's a big mass of words. It's clearly not written for uh, easy, easy legibility. Now this is interesting, let's take a look at that. Gorilla lines, pan, human lines. Now that's interesting. So what happened here, what happened there to split these lines? What happened there? This is a really interesting chart, look at that. Nice. Yeah, that's really interesting. Okay, oh, I'm gonna skim this. The divergence of a proto-human and pre-human lineage separate from Pan appears to have been a process of complex speciation hybridization rather than a clean split taking place over a period of anywhere from 13 million years ago, close to the age of the tribe, and some four million years ago. Different chromosomes appear to have split at different times with broad scale hybridization activity occurring between the two emergent lineages as late as five million years ago. This research group noted that one hypothetical late hybridization period was based on a particularity of the similarity of the X chromosomes. The research group noted that one hypothetical late hybridization period was based on, in particular, on the similarity of X chromosomes in the proto-humans and stem chimps. Stem chimps, I imagine the, that's the, the chimps at the beginning who were, who were first different from us, suggesting the final divergence event as recent as four million years ago. Wakeley rejected these hypotheses. He suggested alternate explanations, including selection pressure on the X chromosome in, now, the X chromosome is carried by the female. Selection pressure. The ancestral population prior to the chimpanzee human last common ancestor. Most DNA studies find that humans and pan are 99% identical, but one study found only 94% commonality with some of the difference 
see, this should be able to be figured out. I mean, how can you not just take the, the genes and the chromosomes and compare them? And the computer with AI should be able to calculate this out. Um, with some of the difference occurring in non-coding DNA, it is most likely that the australopithecine dated from three to 4.4 4 million years ago evolved into the earliest members of the genus Homo in the year 2000 after the discovery of Ororinogenesis dated as early as 6.2 million years ago briefly challenged critical events of that hypothesis as it suggested that Homo did not, in fact, derive from Australopithecine ancestors. Yeah, it doesn't look like it. All the listus fossil genera are evaluated for one, probability of being ancestral Homo, and whether they're closely related to Homo than any other living primate. Two traits that could identify them as homoids da, 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 are broadly thought to be ancestral. Others, especially early genera, are supported by one community of scientists, but doubted by another. So one thing I'm not seeing here is I'm not seeing how the homin homininy diverged from the gor gorilla. Was it because the gorilla was born with bigger teeth? Was it the because the gorilla didn't like sugar as much? Was it because the gorilla was larger? I guess we'd have to think about this. And then this would be another line of hypothesis and conjecture and, and, and study as well. Okay, so let's go to last common ancestor with the chimps. The most, the last common ancestor due to complex hybrid speciation it is not possible to give precise estimate on the age of the ancestral population. While original divergence between populations may have occurred as many as 13 million years ago, hybridization, that means interbreeding, I mean, very similar looking species may have been ongoing and recently as 4 million years. Well, then the split hasn't occurred until 4 million years ago. In human genetic studies, CHLCA is a useful as an anchor point for calculating single nucleotide polymorphism rates. Substitution of a single nucleotide that occurs at a specific position in the genome where each variation is presented at a level of one half of a percent from person to person in the population. Rates in the human populations where chimpanzees are used as an outgroup. That is, as the extant species most genetically similar. Yeah, we know that part. Source of confusion in determining the exact age of the pan homo split is evidence of a more complex speciation process rather than a clean split between the two lineages. Different chromosomes appear to be split at different times, possibly over as much as four million year period, indicating a long drawn out speciation process with large scale hybridization of events between the two emerging lineages, lineages as recently as 6.3 to 5.4 million years ago, according to Patterson et al. Speciation between Pan and Homo occurred over the last 9 million years. Um, the assumption of late hybridization was in particular based on the similarity of the X chromosome in chimpanzees and humans, suggesting a divergence as late as 4 million years ago. This conclusion was rejected as unwarranted by Wakeley who suggested alternate high explanations, including selection pressure on the X chromosome in the populations of ancestral HCHLCA. Complex speciation and incomplete lineage sorting of genetic sequences seem to also happen in the split between the human lineage and that of the gorilla. In the, indicating messy speciation is the rule rather than the exception of large primates. Such a scenario would explain why the divergence age between Homo and Pan has varied with the chosen method and why a single point has so far been hard to track down. 
well, what we know is that humans live on the ground. Um, and they've always lived on the ground as far back as you can imagine humans. And the, the apes live, the, the gorillas live in the trees. So there must have been something about our ancestors that made us more successful on the ground, a mutation of some sort, or that, um, something that made it more successful for the, the chimps to be up in the trees. So let's see if we can look and see what it is that makes them different from humans. Could it be another one of those wrist mutations, for example? Muscle strength. Chimpanzees are known for possessing a great amount of muscular strength, especially in their arms. However, compared to humans, the amount of strength reported in media and popular science is greatly exaggerated with a number of four to eight times muscle strength of a human. And the numbers stem from two studies. These studies were refuted in 43, and an adult male chimp was found to pull about the same weight as an adult man. Pull, that's different. Corrected for the body studies, the chimps were found to be stronger than humans, but not anywhere near four to eight times. In the 60s, these tests were repeated, and chimps were found to be twice the strength of a human when it came to pulling weights. The reason for higher strength seen in chimps compared to humans are thought to come from longer skeletal muscle fibers that can generate twice the work output over a wider range of motion compared to skeletal muscle fibers in humans. So there was a mutation that made either our muscles, our ancestors' muscles weaker or their muscles stronger. And that mutation, which perhaps is on the X chromosome, perhaps it's affiliated with testosterone maybe, that that led to larger muscle. I would say that their testosterone level of chimps is probably generally higher than most humans. So they have more testosterone. Is testosterone on, on the X chromosome? Let's see, where, where does it come from? Chromosome. Uh, does not say on which chromosome it is. That's not helpful. Gene. I'm just wondering where the testosterone is, is generated. Is it in the gonads or is it somewhere else? I don't know. Interesting though. So shall we look just a little bit more? Doot, doot, where are we at? Chimpanzees versus the bonobo. Anatomical differences between the common chimpanzee and the bonobo are slight. Most, both are omnivorous, as in they might eat some bugs, but mainly fruitivorous fruit-eating diet. Yet sexual and social behaviors are markedly different. The common chimpanzee has a troop culture based on the beta males led by the alpha male. A lot of testosterone, a lot of fight, flight, flee. Highly complex social relationships. The bonobo, on the other hand, has an egalitarian, nonviolent, matriarchal, led by women, sexually receptive, um, meaning they, they, they will have sex with each other. Bonobos frequently have sex sometimes to help prevent and resolve conflicts. Different groups of chimpanzees also have different cultural behavior with preferences for types of tools. Different types of chimps also have different cultural behavior 
with preferences for different types of tools. The common chimpanzee tends to display greater aggression than does the bonobo. Well, yeah, if you have a higher test testosterone level, that's, affiliate, that's associated with um, aggression. The average captive chimpanzee sleeps nine hours, 42 minutes per day. Contrary to the scientific name, chimpanzees do not spend their time in, obviously. So we should look at the bonobos because we don't have the testosterone level, <laughs> humans don't, as the chimps. We're on the wrong page here. Uh, so how do we get to the bonobos? Uh, 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 there we are, bonobos. The bonobo, historically called the pygmy chimpanzee, which is smaller, less testosterone, and less often the dwarf, so these were the smaller ones, is the endangered great ape and one of the two species making up the genus Pan, the other being common chimpanzee. Although bonobos are not a subspecies of chimpanzee, they split, they're not subspecies, but rather a distinct species in their own right. Both species are sometimes referred to collectively using the generalized term chimpanzees. This really reminds me of the difference between the humans, Homo sapiens, and the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals, did, did they have higher testosterone levels? Were they more muscular and stronger? And then the humans were less so. Um, so the, the humans would have been, been more loving and egalitarian, equal for everybody, whereas the, the Neanderthals would have been less so, comparatively speaking. <sighs> Although bonobos are not subspecies of chimpanzee, rather distinct species than all right. Both species are sometimes referred to collectively in the generalized term chimpanzees. But let's just call them the bonobos. Uh, bonobo, nobo, nobo, bonobo. Uh, taxonomically, the members of the chimpanzee bonobo tr subtribe Penina are closely termed penines. The bonobo is distinguished by relatively long legs, like humans, pink lips, like humans, dark face, like humans in Africa, um, tail tuft through adulthood, tail tuft, tail tuft, what is that, tail tuft, you don't have tails, long parted long hair on his head, <laughs> parted long hair, the bonobo is found in a 500,000 kilometer square area of the Congo Basin. Congo Basin. So how is that compared to the Atavango? Let's go to the Congo. Congo River is what we're talking about. Not, not very far. So apes probably lost their tail in the around here. And then the, the bonobos currently live around here. All right, let's keep going. It says they're omnivorous, but it has no evidence to that. So we'll Take a look at that. Inhabits primary and secondary forests. Well, humans don't do that. They, they live on the plains. They're plains dwelling. That's why they're tall. Because of political instability in the region, the timid, timidity of the bonobos, there has been relatively little field work done observing the species in natural habitat. Wow. Wouldn't that be awesome for some people to go out there and spend some time with bonobos? Hopefully, some people who already live in the Congo. That would be great. Along with common chimpanzee, the bonobo is the closest extant relative to humans. The two species are not proficient swimmers. As the two species are not proficient swimmers, humans are. Maybe it's because we were able to swim that separated us from them. That would have been a big deal, right? We're proficient swimmers. Um, the formation of the Congo River possibly led to the speciation of the bonobo. So the bonobo lives south side of the river and therefore were separated from the ancestors of the common chimpanzee, which lives in the north of the river. There are no concrete data on the population. Of, really, that's so interesting. So the river, the Congo, they don't swim well. So what did it say there in the south? The 
chimps live to the north of the river, the bonobos live to the south. Well, the south, the weather's more the same, I would think. Hmm. Let's move this one over. So to the south of the river, the bonobos lived. To the north, the chimps lived. But they evolved more testosterone. They're stronger. Hmm. I'm just going to tuck that away in the back of my mind as I think about this. As the two species are not proficient swimmers, the formation of the Congo River possibly led to the speciation of the bonobo. Bonobos live south of the river, therefore are separated by their ancestors, the common chimps, which live to the north of the river. The formation of the river was about 2 million years ago. When did we separate from the chimps, the, the humans? Uh, na, 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 na. Uh, uh, uh. Six million years ago. So six million years ago, our line separated from the chimp line. Two million years ago, the bonobo line separated. And actually, that's, I mean, we've got all sorts of species, cousin species that are closer than that. Um, the species is listed as an endangered, that's bad, is threatened by habitat destruction, that's super bad human population growth and movement through commercial poaching, murdering them, is the most prominent threat. Bonobos typically live 40 years in captivity. Their lifespan in the wild is unknown. It's almost certainly shorter. Why certainly shorter? If they're eating all natural foods, it would probably be certainly longer, depending on predation. Um, taxonomy, description. Bonobo is commonly considered the more, more gracile. What does gracile mean? Slender. Humans are slender. Than the common chimpanzee. Although large male chimpanzees can exceed any bonobo in bulk and weight, the two species actually broadly overlap in body size. Adult female bonobos are somewhat smaller than adult males. Body mass in males ranges up to 60 kilograms, 100, 130 pounds, against the average female which is 60, 30 kilograms, about half the size. The total length of bonobos from the nose to the rump, while all fours, when adult bonobos and chimps stand on their legs, they can both attain. The bonobo's head is relatively smaller than that of the common chimp with less prominent brow ridges. Brow ridges. It has a black face with pink lips, small ears, wide nostrils, long hair on its head that forms a parting. Females have slightly more prominent breasts, in contrast to the flat breasts of other female apes, although not so prominent as those of humans. The bonobo hull also has slim upper body, narrow shoulders, thick neck, long legs, when, long legs, legs when compared. Bonobos are both terrestrial and arboreal, so on the ground and in the trees. Most ground locomotion is characterized by quadrupedal knuckle walking. Bipedal walking has been recorded in less than 1% of terrestrial locomotion in the wild. They figure that decreases, decreased with habituation. So that's culturally learned that they are walking on all fours or not. While in captivity, there is wide variation. Bipedal walking in captivity as a percentage of bipedal plus quadrupedal locomotion bouts has been observed and 4% for spontaneous bouts and nearly 90% when abundant food is around. These physical characteristics as its posture give the bonobo an appearance more closely resembling that of humans than of common chimpanzee does. The bonobo also has a highly special, uh, has highly individuated facial features, as humans do, so that one individual may look significantly different from another, a characteristic adapted for visual, facial recognition and social interactions. I wanna know how many live in the groups. Multivariate analysis show bonobos are more neotenized. Uh, is the delaying or slowing of the physiological development of the organism, typically an animal. Ne neoteny is found in modern humans. So very slow growing up. Taking into account such features as the proportionally long torso length of the bonobo, the research challenged this conclusion. General. 
primatologist Franz de Waal states bonobos are capable of altruism, compassion, empathy, kindness, patience, and sensitivity, and are described, described bonobo society as a genocracy, a matriarchy. Primatologists who have studied bonobos in the wild have documented a wide range of behaviors, including aggressive behavior and more cyclical sexual behavior similar to chimpanzees, even though bonobos show more sexual behavior in a greater variety of relationships. An analysis of female bonding among wild bonobos stresses female sexuality and shows how female, female bonobos spend much more time in asterisks than female chimpanzee, chimpanzees. Some primatologists have argued that De Wall's data reflect only the behavior of the captive bonobos, suggesting that wild bonobos show levels of aggression closer to that is found among chimpanzees. De Wall has responded at the, that the contrast in temperament between the bonobos and chimpanzees observed in captivity is, meant, is meaningful because it controls the influence of the environment. Two species have quite differently, behave quite differently even if kept under identical conditions. A 2014 study also found bonobos to be less aggressive than chimpanzees. We knew that particularly the Eastern chimpanzee. The author argued that the relative peacefulness of Western chimpanzees and bonobos was primarily due to ecological factors. So something in the environment made them less um, necessarily aggressive. Social behaviors. Many studies indicate that females have a higher social status in bonobo society. Aggressiveness, aggressive encounters between males and females are rare. The men and the women don't fight. And males are tolerant of infants. The men like the babies and the juveniles. A male derives his status from the status of his mother. So the wife brings status. The mother-son bond often stays strong and continues throughout lifetime, which is common in human society as well. While social hierarchies do exist, and although the son of a high-ranking female may outrank a lower female, rank plays a less prominent role in other primate societies because it's egalitarian, it's altruistic. Due to the promiscuous mating behavior of female bonobos, a male cannot be sure which offspring are his. As a result, the entirety of parental care in bonobos is assumed by mothers. The entirety of parental care in bonobos is assumed by the mothers. So the mothers are the ones that, you know, they make sure that the babies are taken care of. Bonobo party size tends to vary because the groups exist, exhibit fission fusion pattern. A fission fusion pattern is one in which the size and composition of the social group change as time passes and animals move throughout the environment. Animals merge into a group, fusion, sleeping in one place or splitting, fission, foraging in small groups during the day. A community of approximately 100 will split into small groups during the day while looking for food and will come back together to sleep. They sleep in nests that they construct in trees. Okay, so diet. The bonobo is a frutivore. 97% of his diet is fruit. That is supplemented by leaves, honey, eggs, and meat from small vertebrates, such as rodents, blind squirrels, dweekers. How would you be able to, how, how is a bonobo able to catch, catch a dweeker? Um, what is this study right here? Observations of the mating and behavior of wild bonobos. I would be looking into that. that this seems like it is uh, unlikely. One study, meat from small, and invertebrates. Invertebrates, yeah, well, I mean that I believe. This study, I think we would have to look into that. I find it doubtful that the bonobos, who are egalitarian, are chasing down duikers. Really? You think they're gonna be chasing them down when they have fruit? No, they're going to eat the fruit. What a crazy thing. Um, I don't know who inserted that, but remember, Wikipedia can be edited by, anyone, edited by anyone. In some instances, bonobos have been shown to consume lower order primates. Consume? Hmm. Well, 62. Is it the same guy? Some claim bonobos have been practiced cannibalism in captivity. Well, if they're trapped and they have nothing else to eat, 
However, at least one confirmed report of cannibalism in the wild over the dead infant was described. Peacefulness, similarity, distribution, conservation status, all very interesting. So what was the original question again? Uh, the original question was, when did humans lose their tails? Why don't humans have tails? When did humans lose their tails? Why did apes lose their tails? Oh, and interestingly, I forgot to mention this one, and I'm going to hide that. Occasionally, humans are born with tails. So there is something that can cause um, whatever prevents the tail from growing, which is dominant, strongly dominant, very rarely, extremely rarely, that will not be present in utero, and a tail will grow. <laughs> a bear tail, but a tail all the same. Hmm. Thank you so much for joining me on this learning adventure. This is the type of adventure that I consider amazing learning that can be facilitated by one person alone doing their own in-depth search on the internet. Any topic, any question that you're curious about, you can learn and find interesting things out about. Just pose a question, start somewhere. The Wikipedia is an invaluable tool, remembering that it can be edited with anybody who has any particular agenda. Um, there are other encyclopedias, like Everyopedia, I believe, Everyopedia. And then Everyopedia has lots of interesting articles. Let's see if we could type in Bonobo here and see what it says. It might be almost identical, or it might be slightly different from the Wikipedia article. See, it's basically the identical article because it's got the exact same reference. So when you're trying to learn something, go on the internet with a question and explore. Notice things you need are a computer. You need to have access to the internet. You need to have a curiosity. You need to have a, a thoughtfulness. You need to have the more background knowledge you have, the, the more useful it is. Notice how Google Earth was extremely useful and an understanding of climate change was extremely useful and how just two degrees of climate change can cause a global glaciation, um, have some, having some knowledge of impacts and volcanism, volcanoes, that can be very useful, um, and having time, time to just think things through. And I tried to think through everything as it was coming. These are the types of adventures, learning adventures I love going on on the internet. And sometimes it's not just me, it's me and one of my sons. So when you're thinking about teaching and learning, learning and teaching, exploring, how your children can learn more, how your parents can learn more, how your family can learn more. Um, the internet is an amazing, amazing tool. It should be free and available for everyone so everyone can learn as much as they want. It should be a public service, just like any other public service. It could be, I should say. If we want, if we desire that everyone learns as much as they can learn, and can explore as much as they want to explore, and can invent new and different things, find new hypotheses, find new ideas, make new connections, build their mental capacity, then this is something that needs to be available. Thank you so much for joining me in this learning adventure. It went a lot further than I thought, but I still think it leaves a lot of open questions and a lot of things yet to learn and explore. Please, if you have not yet already, press the like that's right down here somewhere and then press you know subscribe and um, if you hit the little bell for notifications you can put in your email and then you get email notifications and then over in the comments if you put in the comments I know that we went a long ways in this but if you found this interesting if you find this process interesting of self-questioning exploring self-questioning and exploring then write down a little something down there if you appreciated this, let me know. Uh, if you've done similar explorations and you've come on like other like insights, 
I'd love to hear them. That'd be wonderful. And I'll do my best to either thumbs up or at least respond in some way to every comment that I get. Thank you so much for spending your time with me today and have a good one. See you around.